Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the LSE. I'm Howard Davis, the director of the school. We have rather a lot of directors here tonight, but I'm merely here uh, to uh, say good evening to you, to those of you who are here for the summer school or for other visitors to the school for other purposes. And I'm very pleased to be able to welcome to the school tonight both Neil McGregor, director of the British Museum, and Nick Sirota, director of the Tate, and John Wilson between them, who is going to be master of ceremonies. Um, I think it's the first time since I've been here that Neil McGregor has been here, and we are uh, glad to see him at a time when he still hasn't lost his marbles. Um, <laughs> and uh, we have a lot of Greek students here, so you may get some trouble on that. Uh, score later. Um, and I suppose I should welcome Nick Sirota as well. You may think that's a slightly disobliging welcome, um, but I am actually a trustee of the Tate, indeed have been chairman of the Tate briefly this last year, and so uh, for a brief period uh, I like to, like to fantasize that um, Nick Sirota was working for me. Um, <laughs> that's uh, not true, he's never worked for anyone else I don't think, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, during the seven years I've been a trustee, um, I've been to the Tate, I guesstimated today, at about 180 times, and this is the first time he's been to the LSE. So this is a very small, <laughs> small recompense for that service. So, um, John, over to you, but uh, I do hope this is a stimulating evening, as I'm sure it will be. Thank you. I think Thomas is going to say a couple of words first of all. Before we start, a couple of words from Thomas Norright of Thames. Um, I'm Thomas Norright, I'm chairman of Thames and Hudson, and uh, it's a huge pleasure and privilege to welcome everyone and to see the um, amazing reality of strange idea, not well formulated, which we came up with when we were beginning to think about how we should. Uh, celebrate 60 years of uh, Thames and Hudson. And uh, with input from all of these people whom you see to my right, and to Howard Davis, and lots of other people too, um, everything has crystallized um, into this, which is somehow the centerpiece of our birthday. Um, at Thames and Hudson, we've had links with museums and galleries um, in this country really since the beginning, earliest days, uh, late 40s, early 50s. And uh, one, some of the early books were devoted to the treasures in the British Museum and others to the great paintings in the National Gallery. Um, and we've also had links with the directors of that time and um, the two directors who you see on stage today. Happy links, um, they both um, were so kind as to deliver lectures which we set up some years ago uh, in memory of my father who founded Thames and Hudson. Um, so, the, so this event has, I think, um, great meaning for me because it seems to um, pull together lots of strands and, and, and links. Um, I think both in the museum world and um, at Thames and Hudson, we share a belief that uh, art is there to be enjoyed, but it's enjoyed more if one's more informed about it. Um, and we try very hard in our modest way with our books to make that information available. Um, and I also thought it would be wonderful venue for us, the LSE, London School of Economics and Political Science, because of course art isn't produced in the vacuum. It's part of um, the social organism as a whole, um, and always has its connections with um, the state and government and citizens of the country. So that's why I thought it would, is really a splendid thing to be here. Um, not in, a, not in a museum lecture hall, but um, somewhere which has a different connection with life. Anyhow, 
Um, I could go on talking about lots of things, um, but I'm going to hand you over and let you listen to what I'm sure will be a very stimulating discussion. Thanks very much to Thomas, first of all. Congratulations to Thames and Hudson. I'm sure I'm not the only person in this room uh, whose uh, bookshelves at home sag and creak under the weight of uh, 60 years of output, partly thanks to Thames and Hudson. We're here to consider the idea of the museum of the 21st century, its role, its problems, its future, and to get a unique perspective uh, from the two preeminent uh, and most powerful museum directors of modern times, Sir Nicholas Sirota and Neil McGregor. A modern museum is, of course, more than uh, a repository of, of history and culture. I think at its best, it's, it's a kind of crucible of new ideas. Being a museum director is, I presume, something like being an alchemist. You're trying to come up with new ways of telling old stories, telling new stories from old artifacts. And one of the ways of doing this is by bringing two disparate elements together, two individuals, two stories. Uh, Picasso and Matisse, that story was told at Tate Modern. And uh, we learnt how those two great geniuses rubbed up against each other, rubbed off each other, and created new ideas, new stories. More recently, at the British Museum, the Shah Abbas exhibition, some of, the, some of the visitors there, when I was wandering around, looked a bit perplexed to see Chinese porcelain and pottery in the glass cases, wondered what it was doing there in an exhibition about a 17th century Iranian ruler. And it's, of course, because Shah Abbas created in Isfahan a, a nexus, a meeting place, a crossroads, uh, where new ideas came together, new culture was made. Tonight we have um, two people who have never shared a stage before. Uh, in the film business, I think they call it above the title billing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, the I was going to say the titans of the museum world, so, but that would suggest a clash of the titans. Maybe another film springs to mind, Michael Mann's Heat, Pacino and De Niro. So, uh, <laughs> it's the first time they met, look what happened. Um, I hope it's gonna, this is going to be a more dramatic evening, actually, than that one, because that was a bit of a disappointment. But I give you Sirota and McGregor. Um, let's start with, this is a very different 21st century to the one that we set out on nine years ago. In fact, it's a very different 21st century to, to the one of, of only two years ago. Time to time, we're going to talk about the way that uh, the, uh, the economic world is impinging on your job. But let me just start with a personal perspective. You've both been in your respective jobs, or both been national museum directors for almost exactly the same amount of time. Neil, you joined the National Gallery in 87, 87 I think. Yeah. And, and Nick, you became the director of the Tate in, in 88. So let me just start by asking you the same question. Why are you still here? <laughs> <laughs> what keeps you in the job? Yeah. Neil. I think there are, there are two things. They're both really quite obvious things. I mean, the, the first is the daily opportunity of that moment that every one of us has had at some time of just being alone with one of the greatest things in the world. And the fact that every morning you can just be alone with Ramesses II uh, does, well, it not only is that a great, a great thing, but also it reminds you that actually what may be worrying you at the moment about particular governments or particular preoccupations are really fairly minor in the long sweep of things. And that chance of daily living with the greatest things is, I think, completely incomparable. And you do a daily tour. You do turn up early and you'll go and visit yes, an artifact exactly, exactly. or something. Yes, or look at the latest leak or whatever. Right, but right. You know, looking at the leak takes you past Ramesses II, which is also... <laughs> that, um, and then the other bit of that, which is the exact opposite, um, but which is, again, the, the great pleasure is when you put on, uh, when the museum opens, just to look at the colossal numbers of people of all sorts, all kinds that actually come. And last year, for instance, we had an exhibition of 20th century America in the prints from the permanent collection, 400,000 people. The, oh, the pleasure of just watching so many different kinds of people coming to look at those things, engage with them, enjoy them, think about them. Uh, there's nothing, I think, that really beats that. And the great thing is it's not like a performance at all because you're not doing anything. You're just watching. It's the great voyeur's pleasure of being a museum director. And, and Nick, is it still a thrill? It, or, or is the enjoyment as, uh, as Howard suggests because you've never had a real boss? Um, I've had five chairmen and I've outlasted them. I don't, think, <laughs> I don't think there'll be any sense... I don't think even Howard would have a sense of not having been able to make an, have an influence on the tape. I mean, I think that... I mean, to add to what Neil has said, clearly, 
the experience of being able to walk between the galleries, both during the day and at night. Perhaps too many nights, <laughs> and too, many, too many dinners and too many evenings, but at the end of those evenings you can just simply go into the galleries and see, as Neil says, some of the great works um, of art in the collection. I could say, if, because no one's offered me a better job. <laughs> Someone's offered you a different job, though, haven't they? Well, you, I, said you, I said better. <laughs> yeah, well, I, yeah, that, yeah. But I didn't say better, because that's why I wonder why you didn't take the job that well, you were reported to have been offered at the, at the Met. I don't think York. there's anywhere, I'm sure Nick would agree with this, I don't think there's anywhere at the moment in the world where what is possible through public collections is as, uh, as various and as rich as it is in London. I mean, there's an extraordinary opportunity in London through the collections and through the publics in London to address issues that I don't think are possible to address in any other city through the collections. I don't really could agree with that. I think that's true. And I, but I, what I also think is that the museums sit within society in a very different place from the place that they occupy, the position they occupied in, in America. And to work here has its challenges, but undoubtedly there are rewards really arising from the fact that we work for so many different kinds of people. And we're not working simply to a board of trustees. We're working to everyone in this room who owns the collections mm. that we look after. And it's an extraordinary challenge. And you were clearly being disingenuous there, because I presume you're at the head of many a headhunters <coughs> list. And if you were offered a big job in America, and I'm sure it's probably happened, is, is one of the the problems that you would face, because as you alluded to there, because there is a very powerful board in America, very often fueled by, by money. Um, well, they're fueled by many things, but money is probably only part of it. They're fueled by, well, like any board of trustees, they're fueled by a whole range of issues. But I think that, frankly, the money <coughs> aspect of it and the trustees would only be a small part of the challenge in America. I think the museums of nothing like is connected with their publics as we are. And I think that informs the way in which they work in all kinds of ways. I, mean, actually, I don't want, to, I mean, I, I don't want to, to put words into Nick's mouth, but I, I, we've talked about it enough that I know it's true. One of the reasons why I think we both still enjoy being where we are is because being museum director in Britain is unlike any other in the world because it's free. You're dealing with a totally different relationship, as Nick says, with the public. I mean, what that long tradition of real civic ownership of the collections has done is to transform the relationship between public and collections. And there's no other city in Europe or America where that's true. And that does, I think, make it uh, an infinitely more exciting job here than, than anywhere else. And you say you, you, you've had that conversation. Do you often compare notes? Oh, yes. The whole time, particularly about trustees. And about journalists. And about, well, yeah. <laughs> do you, could you do each other's jobs, do you think? Have you no. ever considered a job swap? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't. I don't know enough about the, about, about the world Nick runs but, at all. I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't imagine being at the National Gallery or the British Museum. That's just a very, <laughs> <laughs> a very, no, very mean, diplomatic okay, answer. No, okay. Okay. I mean, one of the great pleasures of working with Tate is the fact that we're so close to artists. Three of the trustees out of 12 are artists. Um, most of what I've done in my life has been worked, been working very closely and learning from artists. And of course, there are artists on the board of the British Museum, but they don't play the same role. And I think that that's a very powerful strength within the institution. I mean, people in America and elsewhere, and, and in, in, in Europe, are always astonished when I say that we have three artists on the board of trustees. They represent 25% of the board of trustees, and in um, America, that's unheard of. I think there's one trustee out of 40 who's an artist on the board of Whitney. Mm. And it does make a fundamental difference to the whole tenor of the institution. Uh, black clouds are gathering over the country, over public spending. Do you fear the reaper? <laughs> Is it going to be a tough couple of years at least? I think it'll be a tough five years. Um, but I think that because of the, the strengths that we've been discussing and touching on in relation to 
of public appreciation and engagement with museums in this country, I'm sure will come through. Not least because I think that without wanting to offer too many hostages to fortune, it's going to be much more difficult for politicians to cut funding for museums in the 21st century than it was at the end of the 20th century. And I think that Neil alluded to the whole question of free admission. I think that the campaign through the 90s, which he and I and the British Museum, in, 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 in the form of Robert Anderson, were engaged in, in persuading trustees and indeed government ultimately, that it was the right regime for museums in this country, has changed, the, as I said before, the relationship between our publics and our institutions. And I think that that has given us a strength which wasn't there. It is the, fact, the, fact that a, the fact that a Tory shadow spokesman on the arts can ostensibly lose his job because he raised the question of re the reintroduction of admission judges tells you how much this culture has changed. Do you not worry that the, it is a reversible offer, though, that a, a future government might look at your visitor numbers, might say, you are doing very, very well. There are people pouring through your doors in record numbers. Charge them to come in. No, of course, uh, I mean, that, that's, that's a perfectly possible conversation. But I think what's changed is, is, is really the whole way in which people use the collections. Uh, and the understanding that, one of, that these are now a real central element in our civic life. Mm. And all parties are clear that one of the things that needs to be fostered and developed are those elements that construct civic cohesion. And the way, the symbolic value of having the greatest things equally available to every citizen is enormous. But also the, the way people clearly do use collections now, and I think this is one of the big changes of the last uh, generation, to address the world and themselves now. There's no doubt at all that people are, that, that visitors use the collection to think about the world, to think about themselves. They've become a real part, I think, of the consciousness of, of us as citizens of this country. And I think that's changed. That, that wasn't, I don't think people would have f used those kind of words or thought in that way uh, 30 years ago. I think that really has changed. You, you both, sorry, Nick. No, I, think, I, think it's, I think Neil's right about 30 years ago, but interestingly, I think that in the 1820s and 1830s, they might have thought more in those terms, at least mm -hmm. when you read reports of parliamentary debates about the value of having a national gallery in Trafalgar Square or whatever. Those sentiments are very present. And is that, that is, that's, of course, the most interesting But Again, that's why I think that this country's institutions are so different from any other, because, precisely as Nick says, this is, this is not, in any sense, uh, a post-1945 uh, welfare state uh, dispensation. Mm. The, the reason the National Gallery is still in Trafalgar Square um, is because that's where it was thought that the poor from the East End would be able to walk to join the rich who would drive from the West End, mm. and that you would actually have everybody together in the same place. Those arguments, in slightly different form, are just as important now. The fact that museums and galleries are a place where all the different elements of our population can and do mix. I mean, the, the mix of visitors is extraordinary. Um, and I think that language, is, as, as Nick says, it's a 19th century language, but it's, 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 it's returned, I think, to the to, to centre stage. And you alluded to the um, Tory shadow arts spokesman who lost his job for raising the question. Now, you both became muse National Museum directors in the late 80s, and I presume your jobs were signed off by a Tory government, by Mrs Thatcher, in fact. Mm -hmm. uh, so over 20 years ago, what, how has the political landscape changed from the point of view of a museum director? Do you feel there that we are living in more enlightened times in terms of the politics and the attitude towards culture and, and museums? Marginally. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that, um, as I said earlier, I think it would be much more difficult for politicians to cut me grants to museums than it would have been 20 years ago. Um, but there's still, it's quite difficult to name five politicians who could be regarded as effective secretaries of state. 
of culture, of culture, media, art. and sport. Yeah. I mean, it, the benches of the House of Commons are not overflowing with people at present who seem to have an ambition to be to to take that post. There's no, you know, Brent Bradshaw is, a, in my view, a good appointment, but nevertheless, there aren't a lot of people around to take those roles. I would take a much more hopeful view on that. I think um, I think Parliament is seething with closet aesthetes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but one of the extraordinary conventions of our public life is that any biopic put forward by any public figure has to finish with what football team they support. <laughs> They're absolutely obligatory. Um, we will soon, I'm sure, get to the stage where the last line is... I stood on the plane. Uh, I stood on the or you know, X is particularly fond of Matisse, or has long an interest in Dura. Um, but because what... I mean, I think, uh, I think it's, it's, you know, it's clear. There's now, after all, uh, I mean, there's now a minister in the cabinet with this responsibility. That wasn't the case um, when we were appointed. Mm. Um, that's, I think, significant. But also, the, 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 the coverage of the, the business of galleries and museums, and perhaps thanks to Nick, I think the coverage of contemporary art in the press and therefore in the public debate has completely transformed. It used to be tucked away rather embarrassedly in the arts pages of the papers. It's now frequently the news sections of the yes. papers. Mm -hmm. And that's an enormous change. And that does change the political debate. The, the arts are an issue politically in a way that they simply weren't, I think, 20 years ago. So they may sit up and listen, or they may take your call, but does it make any difference to the fundamental problem, which is proving that the arts or culture makes a difference when you go to the ministerial table to ask for more money? Uh, that's the f it's still the problem, isn't it? That pr the instrumental argument. What is the best argument to a politician? I don't think there's a single argument. And I think that the non-instrumental arguments have come to the fore in the last four or five years. And I think that the arguments that Neil has advanced, for instance, to the position of the British Museum, as he says, as a repository of knowledge, world knowledge, and indeed its place in civic society, have changed politicians' views of that institution. I think that my colleagues and I have made a case for the significance of the art of our own time as well as the art of the past, and that probably has also had some impact. I think, the, I think that's exactly right. If you, if you think of the world as it was in 1987, um, uh, when Nick was appointed to the Tate, the, on the whole, Britain gave the impression of being a country that really hoped, wished that the 20th century artistic just hadn't happened. There was great embarrassment. We'd never collected a great deal of contemporary material. The private and public collections of the early 20th century were very thin compared with the rest of Europe. Uh, compared dramatically compared with Germany, we were in denial of the, the contemporary. Mm -hmm. That has completely turned around. And I think every politician is aware that if you want uh, particularly a young public capable of taking their place in the world, earning their place in the world, understanding the world, uh, particularly in areas like design, creative industries, they need to see what is being made across the world. And I, I, I think those arguments are very strong. Nick led us on to, very deftly there, onto the international perspective, the idea of nationhood and the global role of museums. Neil, you are the government's special, special envoy to the world, the cultural special envoy. You believe that museums have a role to play in fostering international relations. I mean, just give us some idea of, of your idea of the world collections. Well, uh, the, I think the place to start really is London, because the huge change that's happened, again, I think in the, since the war, mm. is that London at least, and to a large measure the whole UK, but certainly London, is now a city of diasporas, uh, uniquely. It's a city where the world lives and in this very particularly British way, uh, unlike France, where you, if you come to live in France, you have to be French in a particular way, unlike the melting pot of the American model, the, what the UK has tried to do is allow different, different uh, cultural traditions to coexist and to survive, um, and to value 
the, the different traditions while seeing them as necessarily living together and living together in one kind of society. That is, I think, the extraordinary excitement of living in London and the extraordinary excitement of the kind of collections that we have because they reflect historically precisely that phenomenon. What is clear, I think, is that the division between home and abroad doesn't make sense any longer. Uh, it, it, it's, a forced, it's a forced polarity. Uh, people live in different places. People live here with family in Bangladesh or Kenya or wherever. And the collections that London has, because of its imperial history and wealth over several centuries, been able to acquire, are a unique world resource. I mean, the world collections that, uh, that work together to the Tate, British Museum, British Library, uh, Natural History Museum, d and and Kew, together represent a conspectus of the world that you can't find in any other city. And what we've been trying to do is really to make a reality of the notion of trusteeship, which Parliament invented for our museums, and really make a reality of these collections being held in trust for the whole world. And that the collections of London and the expertise in the collections should be available to uh, museums, galleries, curators, scholars across the world in a new way. That, I think, is something that museums uniquely can do uh, in building an international community which starts as a professional world of exchange and trust, but because of the way museums work and exhibitions work, then can reach millions of people across the world. And to go back to your question about the way government responds, I think it was a remarkable decision of James Purnell uh, to give the World Collections a million pounds to spend every year entirely to work overseas. I don't think that's ever happened before. Uh, Recognising that these collections are so important that they must be funded to operate uh, across the world. And I think there you see a, a, a different way of thinking, both about the collections, how they relate to society here, but also to society across the world. And the recognition that, you know, that there is no abroad. I mean, the world is London and London is the world. But what's the Tate's role in this idea of world collections then, Nick? A central and, one. And do you buy the idea of soft power? Um, the position of the Tate has changed dramatically in the last 10 years in this respect, in that until about 2000, it was felt, the institution felt comfortable with representing international and contemporary art by art that came from Northwest Europe and North America. Um, since 2000, we've been collecting more widely across the world, natively, of course, in Latin America, mm -hmm. but also increasingly now in Asia and in the Middle East and North Africa. Not to a great extent, but nevertheless beginning to make progress in those terms. And that has changed, I think, the whole complexion of the institution, or is, perhaps I should say, is changing the complexion of the institution, to the point at which we have partnerships and relationships with the rest of the world that are more analogous to those that the British Museum or Kew Gardens or the Natural History Museum have enjoyed over nearly 200 years. And what's the driving force for that? Uh, is, 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 there a, is there an aesthetic reason or is there a political obligation to follow that path? I don't think there's any political obligation other than the obligation that really exists for any institution of this kind to have a defensible position in the world. And for all the reasons that Neil has mentioned, I think the defensible position for an institution in this city is to look out rather than in. But I think the other driving force, of course, is a recognition that we were blinkered to the extent that we weren't recognizing, if you like, quality and significance in, in, the, in, in the work being made in other parts of the world. And so that has obliged us, really, to look more widely. Uh Culture can make inroads into otherwise hostile territory. You and I were in Tehran earlier this year, sitting around a table in a vice president's office, and I was there as you signed that agreement to bring the Shah Abbas exhibition across to London. Uh, an extraordinary moment, especially to see the Union Jack and the Iranian flag on the table side by side there. 
That, um, that meeting wouldn't happen today, would it? Uh, I think we can safely say it wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so it raises but, the question. But I think it's, it's precisely why those kind of exchanges are so important. Because the, what that agreement was about was the agreement by the Iranians to lend the material to uh, the exhibition about Shah Abbas and the making of Shia Iran around 1600. And I think the, it, we've, we've just learnt again, we've just had a very clear demonstration of how important it is and how difficult it is to understand what the world looks like from Iran and particularly how a particular history shapes the way the world looks and what it means to an Iranian to have a state that is in some sense, in some very particular sense, connected to Shia allegiance. Um, I think that's extraordinarily hard for, for, for Europeans, really, to, to, to European non-Muslims to grasp, but never be more important. And the fact that relations are, again, in a very chilly phase, I think just makes it all the more important to find as many ways as possible of developing these, the, the, these connections. But does it undo all the work that you have done? No, I don't think so at all, because the, uh, obviously I, I, mean, I know no more than, than, than you do about what's actually going on in Tehran, but what is clear is that there is a very large community of museum professionals, academics, who feel very closely engaged with their colleagues in Western Europe, who want to work together, uh, both academically, researching, uh, to understand better what did happen, but also who want to work together as friends and colleagues. Um, and that, that survives. And we know that when, when relations warm up again, <laughs> that network will be in place. And I think that's the great point of these relationships, that they, the friendships can survive the political chills and are a place where new beginnings can, can, can occur. And just for a moment, just to keep you in, in that um, vice president's office, there was a deal done and they suggested that you would lend the Cyrus Cylinder to Tehran. And this, of course, is the, the great, what many people regard as the first declaration of human rights struck by Cyrus the Great. Yes. Um, yes. So I presume that plan is on hold at the moment. Well, we haven't, we, haven't had a, we, we haven't had a telephone call from the embassy for a bit. Um, so um, the, we, we have, of course, said we, I mean, the, we agreed we would lend it um, uh, at, at a point to be mutually agreed. There is and, an expert, uh, sorry. And, and we, you know, we, we, we hope that we will eventually reach that point. And just to, I mean, you talked about having to make these, uh, build these bridges and look to new territories and foster relationships. What about the economic climate? What does that do for sponsorship, which you're so reliant on? Is it going to be possible to continue to have this broad view of the world when, when times are tight, when austerity is looming? I think that uh, having a broader view has depended rather little on sponsorship. It's depended on finding new sources of income, often from individuals rather than from companies. Um, undoubtedly, over the next two or three years, things are going to be more difficult in terms of corporate support. But I do believe there are still, well, there are clearly individuals with great net wealth who are interested in seeing us working in other countries. And frankly, they take a view which is not so much swayed by the political issues of the moment. And they recognize that museums are in it for the long term rather than the short. Uh, Howard Davis referred to it earlier, um, it, the idea of the global collection of the world under one roof. It is an argument that serves your defence of the Parthenon marbles. Now, of course, the Greeks' argument has been considerably strengthened in the last couple of weeks with the opening of the Acropolis Museum. Uh, do you feel that your case is now fatally weakened? I don't think the the existence of new museum changes the, the basis of the argument at all, because that's never been what the argument's been about. The argument is entirely about the value of having a collection where the world can look at the whole world. And I think there's never been a moment where that's been more important than now. It's also, I think, about the question of whether you believe in a shared human culture one culture that is everyone's inheritance, 
or whether you ought to define that in particular national terms. Now, all Enlightenment institutions are, of course, dedicated to the notion of a one shared human inheritance. The 19th century romantic national tradition is another one. There are two perfectly proper ways of considering history, identity, and culture. But they are different ways. And that's really what the debate's about. I don't think it's anything about a particular set of objects. It's really about the question of how you see a culture, a cultural inheritance, and the definition of a national self. And that's the key question for the world, of course. I mean, the, again, it brings us back to a world of diasporas. I mean, after all, we're here tonight to celebrate Walter Neurath, Thomas's father, uh, born in Bratislava, educated in Vienna, changed cultural understanding in London, called his publishing house Thames and Hudson for New York, and was sitting in the Sheikh Zayed Theatre. Uh, uh, whatever else has happened in the last 70 years, we no longer live in a world of simple national identities. And, we've, and that is the key civic question that the whole world has to address. So uh, I think that's the issue, really. So it's a very elegant way of saying they're not going back to Greece. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, that's where you want to put it. But as you focused, as you focused on a particular, I guess, I just want to repeat that this is a totally normal European phenomenon for one great museum to have in it great objects from other European countries. You can't look at Flemish or Netherlandish painting without going to the Prado. You can't really understand the Italian Renaissance without going to the Louvre, and so on. Um, that's how Europe works. That's why Europe is Europe. That's why we are one European identity. All these questions of what might be seen together, should be seen together, is are solved, all these questions are solved by limbs, short-term limbs. That's what every European country sets up. We have been disappointed that we have never had that conversation with the Greek government. Because they say it validates, that it, by accepting the loan, it would by implication uh, send a message to you that they are uh, exactly. a, a, accepting exactly. your claim on the, 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 the it, Yes. So the, I mean, there is an obvious solution. The trustees have made it clear many times that that's the conversation they would like to have. Many of the sculptures, because they're not fit to travel from either museum at all, some are. Um, the obvious thing would be to talk about loans. But actually, I think this is yesterday's debate, yesterday's question. The real question is how do Athens and London together ensure that some of the sculptures that can travel are seen in China, seen in Africa, <laughs> seen in India? That's the question. If these really, if these, we want these to belong to the world, that's the real challenge. But are those political discussions happening? Well, no. Because, because the Greeks are refusing, the Greek, the Greek government, government is refusing the Greek government to talk. has taken a very clear position that it regards the removal as illegal and therefore it cannot acknowledge ownership and therefore it can't have these conversations. Um, that's a great sadness, I think. But it's part of the problem, I think, and I have to say it's a problem, of the politicisation of culture. There may be many things wrong in our system about the way our uh, politicians, uh, as Nick said, are... are insufficiently interested in culture or unwilling to proclaim it. The great, great advantage, the great, in, the great insight of the British Parliament when it first set up a public collection, which was the British Museum in 1753, was to separate it from the government and to make trustees who could not be subject to political direction. I mean, we have in this country, I think, an astonishing inheritance of a depoliticized cultural realm. And that is so valuable. And that's really what, what I think, the, again, this is about. And Nick, I presume you'd like to express solidarity on the issue of the marbles. I can't presume there will be any dissent. Why should there be? <laughs> no, I think that um, we all take enormous pleasure from going to institutions and seeing work in a different context. And frankly, if the only place you could see British art was in this country, the world would be a poorer place. Mm. And equally, you came to the Tate and never saw art from the United States or Latin America or whatever. But the difference is, I, dif I presume the difference is, if you run down your inventory, most of the stuff, that, well, everything there has either been bought or bequeathed. That's and true of the Parthenon sculptures as well. 
Yeah. It's disputed, yeah. though, isn't it? No. No, nobody would dispute that they were bought from Elgin. Right. <laughs> <laughs> There is a legal document. <laughs> My understanding is there is a legal document. Your, par your parliament authorised it. <laughs> Do you? I mean, I know you are. You know, you are driven by a sense of not only you know aesthetic considerations, but morality as well. In those times when you are walking around in the morning at eight o'clock and you are looking at the wonders of the British Museum, is there any time when you walk into the Parthenon galleries and have a quiet, niggling feeling in the back of your head, maybe we shouldn't have these? No. <laughs> <laughs> Because, because, I mean, first thing, I, mean, I, 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 I don't know well, how much time I mean, I'm going to spend John, on. the question would be what purpose would be served? Is that? But I'm also, worrying about it. But, but, mm -hmm. no, but also, so just the mm -hmm. question is because the key question, if you want to take that address, is was it proper for them to be removed from the Parthenon and from Athens? Well, there's no question it was legal because you can't remove those things without the approval of the power of the day. And we know that the, I mean, we know that sometimes it was stopped, sometimes it wasn't authorised, so it was clearly allowed or it wouldn't have happened. But that's not the point. The point is that what happened when those sculptures were removed, and after all, the Greek government has simply continued Elgin's practice and removed the rest now from the building, because you can't see them on the building. When those sculptures came to London, which was the first major city they'd been in, for the first time, they were at a height where people could see them. And for the first time, they were at a place where tens, hundreds of thousands of people could see these were great objects. Um, and that's part of the purpose of a great museum, is to, to enable huge numbers of people to examine closely things that they wouldn't otherwise be able to examine closely. So no problem. And as Nick says, now, What's the point? The, 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 they achieve an extraordinary purpose there. And that's why I don't feel the need to cringe at all. Uh, we do have roving microphones that are being inviting questions from the audience in, in a few moments. I'm not sure how long we've got. I think we've got till about quarter to eight, eight o'clock. So let me just, uh, we started on a, on a personal level, I guess. Why are you still in the museums? Can you just look back over the last 20 years that you've been in those positions of national museum directors? And from a personal perspective, what have been the biggest artistic, the most significant cultural or artistic developments, the ones that have pleased you on a personal level in this country? Okay, if I think of it, one particular instance, it would be the public reaction to the, the demolition of Rachel Wycreed's house. It, it was a work that she originally intended should be destroyed, but nevertheless, within a relatively short period of time, it had engendered a certain public sympathy, a public interest, a feeling that this was a sculpture which in some way ought to get said something about living in East London at a given moment. And the fact that people didn't want to see it destroyed was an indication of the ability of a living artist to connect with a very, very wide range of people. Incidentally, she won the Turner Prize that year, mm. much to everyone's <laughs> surprise, but, but the fact remains that it was at that moment that I felt that certain things were changing in the culture. So that was a key, a, a key moment which, which led on to and, and allowed you to stage a lot of exhibitions that you possibly wouldn't have been able to do at the Tate in the decade before that were not, certainly that were not staged at the Tate, whether, I don't think the permission came from that particular moment. It came, I think, because of the conviction of a group of curators, and indeed the strength of work being made by artists of the present day. But it raises an interesting question about public opinion. Do you have to, as a curator and as a museum director, in effect, stick your finger in the wind and, and feel which way it's blowing? Do you, do you have to? test public opinion at all before you think about staging a particular exhibition? I don't think Mark Wallinger asked anyone whether he would, could stage the work that he put into, <laughs> other than us, uh, uh, the work that he put into the Davines 18 months ago. So the answer to your question, John, would be absolutely no. We don't do market testing on our exhibitions before we stage them. We simply have a conviction that these are artists whose work must be seen. Neil, the most significant cultural artistic sea change over the last 20 years since you've been in charge? 
I just thought it was the assumption now and the reality that the national collections in London will be shared and seen across the whole of the UK, which we all now take completely for granted, um, either through the form of the, the outposts like um, Tate Liverpool or Tate and Dice, or the programmes that all the national museums have of ensuring that the collections travel, are seen, are shared across the, the UK. That's an enormous shift and really has made, a, uh, has made a reality of public ownership of these collections in a way that I didn't think we'd seen before. And you referred earlier to the establishment of the National Gallery being there in Trafalgar Square to allow people from the East End and the West End to come. Of course, this week people are arriving from all over the country to stand in front of the National Gallery. On Which, the exactly, have, have you exactly. applied? Uh, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I spent quite enough time dodging the pigeons in Trafalgar Square. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Nick, have you applied? No, not yet. Uh, were the additions to the Plymouth? Yes. Well, it's a brilliant idea. Brilliant idea. Um, I mean, that, I think the plinth is another of the great phenomena of, of recent times, the re really raising the question of what public sculpture is and what kind of public sculpture we want. And uh, I th again, 20 years ago, it would have been a very narrow group of people that engaged with that, thanks to the fourth plinth competitions, thanks to, and that culminated, of course, in, in Anthony Gormley's project. The, a huge range of public now think rightly think about what is on a plinth in their squares, but also rightly know that it's in some measure their decision. What do you think the point of it is? I think symbolically it does say something about the culture today. You could say it's the Facebook generation presenting themselves to the world. Mm. That's Twitter art. <laughs> 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 Anthony Gorm is one of my trustees, I must declare. I shall, I shall have a very nervous interview tomorrow. <laughs> Twitter art. Uh, the other big uh, question you've got to face in the next few years is the Olympics, the role that art and culture, the cultural Olympiad. Do you have high hopes for 2012? Can art, can culture play a meaningful role in what's going to happen that year? Nick, in fact, you're involved in the committee, I think, aren't you? Uh, well, I'm involved in helping to build the venues and the stadium and the Olympic Park and to some extent regenerate East London and to a more limited degree in, in the cultural Olympiad itself. And can it play a part? Yes, if we give it our effort. And I think if we give it a chance, yes, it can. What does it need other than more and more cash? Uh, it doesn't need cash. It needs good ideas. And I think that they need to be ideas that build on what is currently happening in institutions rather than necessarily inventing some <coughs> magic formula for a, an event or a stunt that occurs just for a short period of time in the summer of 2012. I, I'm just thinking about it now. I've got no idea what's going to be staged in the Cultural Olympiad, and it's not that far off. Are they cutting it too fine? Three years is plenty of time. And I'm sure that Bill Morris would run out a program for you as to what's happening. And he's certainly heavily involved. Neil, give us your perspective on yeah, the well, I mean, Nick said, I mean, three years is the time you would expect normally yeah. to be planning exhibitions or events. I think that's, that's not concerning. We don't yet know what it's mm -hmm. going to be. But I think the, the, it's a great opportunity, as Nick says, uh, not so much dependent on money, but actually on building what's already there, if the politicians would simply articulate clearly that the world culturally exists in the collections of the UK, as it does as nowhere else, then you effectively have a free cultural Olympiad already there. But it's not the way that our politicians are accustomed to talking about the public collections. But it's all there. There is a world cultural festival uh, available in the UK. So the Cultural Olympiad could be a blockbuster and it could cost us nothing. Absolutely. But they just don't get it. Who's, well, who, who? The, 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 I'm sure they do. <laughs> uh, they just haven't told us yet. Why don't they buy that? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get some, should we get some questions from, um, from the audience? We, I think we do have roving microphones. If you want to ask a question, Stick your hand up very high. There's a couple of questions here. Uh, but 
while the question is being asked, while it's being answered, stick your hand high. I'll, I'll have a look up. Um, I know there's a gentleman there who wants to ask a question. Start um, down here. Uh, thank you. Hello, thank you very much. Um, I just wondered, you, you touched upon uh, financing at the very outset, uh, and each year obviously you get a, a, a grant from the government. And I wonder if looking to the 21st century and the next sort of future of the museums, would you prefer that the government simply gave you a, a block endowment which gave you that grant and that you had control over your finances going off into the future, uh, or do you prefer the present system uh, as it's developed over the last sort of 40, 50 years? I, I, I would prefer the present system, uh, notwithstanding everything I said earlier about the political class, simply because I think it obliges us on a daily, weekly, monthly, hourly basis to think about our publics and to think about the people who are in the collections and the people who visit us in a very different way. I think if we simply had a large endowment probably wouldn't be that large coming from any government. <laughs> but if we, whatever the size of it, I think it would insulate us from that great body of our users and owners. No, I'd agree entirely with that. I think it's a critical, critically important link between the collections and the public. Uh, there's another question there, gentlemen there. If you could just actually just say your name and if you are a student here at the LSE and also if you are a uh, a member of the press. I know there are a few journalists here, but I mean, just identify yourself and if there is any. Yeah, K Keith Raffin, um, the press. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not all of it. Um, no, I just wondered how you both saw the educational aspect, the direct educational aspect of both the museum and, and the Tate, Tate Britain and Tate Modern developing. What I, by that I mean are talks, lectures, courses, seminars. I mean, both have very uh, distinguished number of curators, very stimulating, some very entertaining. Do you think they engage with the public enough? Uh, I, start, uh, yeah. the, I mean, certainly I think the, the museum was intended, really, it's the first open university. Um, and that is, that's the purpose of the place, is essentially to enable people to learn, which means that it has to be a teaching institution as well. And I think we're all trying to work out more ways of doing that. Um, uh, it's where the, the big question, I think the big 21st century question, for, certainly for us, is going to be how we use electronic methods to, to, to enable more people to learn from the collection. Um, that's a, I mean, obviously we would do a great deal online and whatever, but that's the real challenge, I think, for the next, for, for the next 20 years. I think a diminishing proportion of our visitors are going to be people who visit the galleries themselves. An ever higher proportion are going to be those people across the world who look to the institutions in London as a source of knowledge, information, engagement, and, it, and in the best sense of the word, entertainment. And I think that we have to invest in our online capacity and we have to encourage our curatorial teams to work there as much as they do in the galleries. Question here from the gentleman in the uh, yes, green jacket. Yes, thank you. Is the microphone on? Is it all right? I'm Amber I'm Gascon, and I can claim a, an so unusual well. distinction this evening that I've served under, and I emphasize under, both our speakers as a trustee of both the National Gallery <laughs> and the Tate. But I would hate to let them go away tonight without addressing the future. We've talked exclusively about the past 20 years, and the topic is the Museum of the 21st <coughs> Century. Now, I want to ask my past masters, what is your vision for the future of the internet and museums. It seems to me the internet is the most remarkable change in human communication since the invention of writing 5,000 years ago in the Middle East. And the extraordinary development of the internet in the last few years has been this incredible ability of the public to join in. At the same time, museums and galleries who 10 years ago were incredibly stingy in their putting of objects online in tiny little versions, now put them online beautifully. You can really see them, you can appreciate them. The information is enormously detailed. Is there not surely an enormous, you've been talking about the world culture, future in which when an exhibition happens, people can see objects that aren't in the exhibition from all around the world in different collections. People can join in in social networking and blogging type ways to comment on what they think about the exhibition and the other things in other parts of the world. It seems to me that is the most extraordinary part of the museum's future and we haven't even begun to look at things like that. The internet generation, 
Yes, I mean, if, uh, I mean, clearly this is the, the key challenge. I think one of the great things that is happening is that uh, I think all the major UK public collections have now decided to, that not only will they put as much of the collection online as possible, but that they will put it online at as high definition as can be managed and allow it to be downloaded free of charge for academic and study purposes. I mean, certainly at the BM, this has already completely transformed the way drawings can be studied uh, because there are high-resolution drawings uh, freely downloadable for study uh, so the entire Old Master Drawing Collection can be studied just as well um, uh, in Africa or in Asia as it can in the print room. Um, the, uh, the idea of making exhibitions visitable is something that uh, I don't know whether Nick and I, we certainly did when we had the big exhibition two years ago about contemporary calligraphy in the Middle East, which was a rare chance to look at the whole Middle East through the public calligraphic tradition. The University of Ramallah asked us if we would construct a visit, uh, a virtual visit, for students that couldn't leave Ramallah and could not actually explore the Middle East's uh, contemporary creation otherwise. And it was done, we, but this is clearly something, this has got to be a way forward. The idea, I think, of, the, of making it a place where, I mean, clearly where people exchange ideas among themselves, there's no difficulty there, but there is certainly a question, I think, about the duty of the museum to be the guarantor of what it believes, what it believes to be sayable, reliably, about the objects. The, the authority of the research about the objects, I think, places some limits on how open that can be, but maybe there's, a, maybe there's a way around that. But I think that's, that's the issue. Nick. Nick. Um, Bam, I think the big challenge for institutions like ours over the next 20 years is going to be to what extent do we wish to simply remain authors and to what extent are we going to become publishers? I mean, to a degree, we've yeah. always been publishers and in the last 20 or 30 years, 40 years, each of these institutions has been publishers in the conventional sense of producing books on the exhibitions that we present. But the degree to which the authority of the institution can be used and can provide a platform for an international conversation mm. is, I think, the big challenge. And the relationship between our authority and ability to do that and those of more conventional publishers or indeed broadcasters is something which I think we need to explore. I'm quite certain that in you know, the next 10, 15 years, we will probably add only a limited number of curators who are principally concerned with the display of objects in galleries, but we will undoubtedly add people who will be effectively commissioning editors working on the presence of the material and fate online. But of course, as Neil says, we're going to have to make a distinction between those things that we ourselves say and those things that other people use our platform to say about themselves or about even our own objects. Yeah. So the Tate and possibly the British Museum becomes a multi-platform operation then. I mean, you're foreseeing yes. Tate TV, we Tate Radio, yes, you do, to, but, yes. you, but, but in, in a far greater way. Yeah, I mean, if yes. we're already making programmes that two weeks before transmission get bought by the BBC who are not investing at an early enough stage in their production to be able to take advantage of you know, the installation of discussion with an artist before an before a show and so on and so forth. Yes, we're doing that already, but I think we'll be doing it to an even greater extent. Yes, I think we, absolutely. I mean, the, the future has to be museum as publisher, broadcaster um, in, in a new way, without question. And a question down here, first of all, um, lady in the second row. So just, just wait one second for the microphone. Hello. The LD marbles apart, how, uh, if you don't mind, just uh, commenting on your views on cultural vandalism, how do you see that? Cultural vandalism? Vandalism. What do you mean? Cultural vandalism. I mean, how would you understand that? If you, heard, if you came across that phrase, how would you understand? I would understand cultural vandalism as the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas. I would understand uh, it as the destruction of monuments that uh, were demolished, um, uh, illicit uh, archaeology, illicit excavations, the illicit trade, uh, what's happened on the great archaeological sites of Iraq, 
these are the great issues of cultural vandalism today, where the history of the world is being destroyed and then disappearing. That's what vandalism is about, destruction. And therefore, does the museum find the, its responsibility to be vocal about such matters? Yes. The museum and plays a great part uh, with the police in London in identifying uh, illicitly traded objects on the market and ensuring their return to Yemen or to Iraq or to Iran or to Egypt, uh, just to give recent examples. I mean, that's a very important part of the museum's role. We mentioned that meeting in the Vice President's office in Iran earlier, yes. and there was, a, there was a discussion there about investigating through UNESCO the yes. damage in, in Gaza. Exactly. So exactly. It, will that be, is that going ahead? I mean, that's not possible at the moment. That's not possible at the moment. Um, I mean, the, there has been uh, a, a great deal of international discussion about, well, the art newspaper ran a very a significant report on the damage to cultural monuments in Gaza. Um, to date, it hasn't yet, as far as I know, been possible for a UNESCO visit to be organized. A couple more questions. A gentleman here on the second row, and um, we'll take that one first. Is there anybody at the back? Sorry, we're just taking people from the front at the moment, but, it, but stick your hand very high. And you can go up there afterwards. Yes, my name is Philip Hughes. There been, hasn't been a single mention yet of acquisitions. What do you feel about acquisitions as we look to the future, both their need, their desirability, their possibility? Are you pessimistic, optimistic, et cetera, et cetera? Could we have just a few moments on acquisitions as we stretch ahead? It's rather different, of course, for the two, for the two speakers, but both of you. I mean, we have no choice on acquisitions. We have to go on collecting the art of today and the art of the recent past. And we obviously, like any museum charged with a historic collection, will seek specific examples that complement what we already have, Philip. Is it going to be easy? No. Are we going to own everything that we show? No. We're going to have to share things. We're going to have to be, I think, thoughtful about what it is that we share because we don't simply want to be moving objects around the world unnecessarily. Um, but undoubtedly, we're going to have to depend to a greater extent, I think, than institutions in this country have for 50 or 100 years on gifts from individuals. And we're going to have to accept there are some things we probably can't have, and possibly even shouldn't have. Shouldn't have. How would you make that distinction? I don't think we need to own every turner that comes up on the market. <laughs> um, that's an easy one. That's an easy, that's an easy one. Sorry? Well, we made a very big effort on the last one because it did complement what we have. It was the single opportunity that we might have to get a great finished Swiss watercolour. And as the director of the Tate did his master's thesis on Turner's visit to Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> there, was never any, there was never any doubt. No, more, serious, no, more seriously, I think it was a great acquisition. Do we need another Titian? Uh, the National Gallery and the National Gallery of Scotland undoubtedly need another Titian. They've got one each. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're not going to be able to afford it, though, are they? I don't know. Everyone, don't thought, know. everyone thought they couldn't afford one. the first. Exactly. Yes, and they dug deep and borrowed widely for that one. But it's, it's uh, well, anyway, I don't it's, think it's not your problem. They were given money. Yeah, they were given money. Yeah, yeah. Question from um, gentlemen. So could, could I ask yes, just briefly on, yeah. on acquisitions? Um, I think Nick's point is the key one. I mean, from, from the, the BM's point of view, of course, the, the, we've got exactly the same obligation to document the contemporary world, not through works of art, mm. uh, necessarily, but actually through artifacts. And one of the interesting models that's uh, growing uh, is to do joint acquisition campaigns, for instance, with Ghana, uh, with colleagues in Ghana. Uh, as you know, the, the Ghanaians have this great habit of produ producing printed cloths to mark all the important national events. So you can actually tell the history of Ghana over the last 50 years through printed cloths. Um, we've been working with colleagues in Ghana jointly to build uh, a great collection of this, where we buy two copies of everything. Um, and then there'll be one in each, in each house. And I think these joint acquisitions um, are, are a real way forward. It's not the same model as Nixon of uh, uh, sh sharing ownership of the same object, but where campaigns of collecting the same area 
can pull together scholarship research and then uh, change. But I think the, the, the collaborative acquisition has certainly got to be the way forward. Absolutely. Question from the gentleman towards the back there. Yes, my name is Richard Cork, and I've been writing about art <laughs> all my life. And um, I want to ask a rather difficult question, actually, if I may. And that's to do with the whole business of booming attendances in galleries and museums around the world. When I was young, I used to go to fabulous collections which were more or less empty. I remember once going to one and asking the guard why there was nobody there except him. And he said, oh, that's quite simple, sir. The director likes it that way. <laughs> Well, we've moved, we've moved on quite a long way since then. We're now having record attendance figures, not only here, but across the world. And, of course, I can't complain about that. It's fabulous in so many ways. But, and there is a but, um, how far can we go? Neil, you said very movingly at one point, I thought, that you loved the opportunity of roaming the British Museum and getting into contact with a work of art on your own. I know exactly what you mean. I'm sure everybody here knows exactly what you mean. Uh, the booming attendances, they're great now, but will they reach a point during the 21st century when they become intolerable and bad for art? Too many people in your galleries. Well, first of all, it's all Thames and Hudson's fault. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is, but I'm being serious, this is, of course, the result of the extraordinary growth of, particularly in this country, of art publishing. It's Kenneth Clark, it's Thames and Hudson, it's a whole series of work to build this huge public. And, of course, you're right, there is, there is a danger um, that, I mean, we all know it's the dialogue with the single thing that changes lives. That's the point of the whole experience. Um, I think the answer for a long time would be simply extending opening hours. Um, if we could stay open longer, uh, then it gets better. But actually, even, the busiest, even in the busiest museums, uh, there are still times of day which are pretty quiet. Mm. So I don't think it's a problem yet, um, particularly not for someone like you, Richard, who can you know, go whenever you choose. <laughs> <laughs> so Look, it is if, a if, you, if you had a job, it would be different. <laughs> <laughs> it is a problem at the Tate. It's a particular problem at Tate Modern, isn't it? When you launch those blockbuster shows, you can't get near the pictures very often. Uh, it's a problem at certain times of the day, as Neil says. If you come early morning or you come late on a Friday, after Friday afternoon, Saturday evening, mm. the galleries are not overcrowded and you can have an experience closer to that which Richard and the director, the present director of the Tate would like. <laughs> Time for a couple more questions. There's a question here, a uh, question down here as well. And I know there's a question over there. Let's take those. If we've got time, we'll go up there as well. We'll just take these three, um, starting with the lady over there, yes. Hi. Um, well, both museums, Tate Modern, and well, Tate and British Museum, has, um, have exhibited um, art in the public realm. Uh, as a part of uh, as an exhibition or a program so it's like the act of taking the art outside the gallery and in a way it's um, breaking with the idea you know like these attitude barriers that make uh, people don't enter to this kind of temple of art do you think this um, act of taking art outside the gallery to, as a part of an exhibition is an opportunity to um, exploit it and use it as a way to develop new audiences and a wider audiences, like to create a bridge within to the museum? Or how you see this in the 21st century, the use of the public realm from the museum, you know? Like the museum's using the public realm to exhibit and, you know, develop new audiences? You talk about public art projects and... Big I mean, sculptures. I'm talking about museums who are curating, who are using the public space, the public realm, you know, like maybe in the riverside of Tate Modern, such as the street art exhibition, such as Louis Bourgeois, or um, the British Museum recently had like this uh, Indian um, exhibition outside and everything. So like, like many, the National Museum had like uh, in 2007, like um, 
uh, the grand tour, you know? I'm talking about this. I'm talking about taking the art outside the gallery in terms to develop new audiences. That's my question on how you see this is an opportunity to develop? How, it's how a, it's a really work? interesting idea, actually, isn't it? Because, I mean, Neil, you talked about loans and that being one of the big projects of the future, but about taking artworks out of their natural habitat, Nick. Well, many of them, of course, when they're in the museum are out of their natural habitat as well. True. But I think that... Um, I don't think we can do everything. I don't think we should... It, I mean, we're sit, we sit here and somehow give the impression that we can do anything and everything. And there may be some things that the Tate, or indeed the British Museum, isn't ideally equipped to do. And there may be some works of art that are in our collections that were acquired in the expectation that they would only be shown in certain very privileged environments. Those might include in institutions across the whole country as well as an institution in London. But I think we can, from time to time, collaborate with other organisations in terms of bringing art into the public domain. But I, th I think that's an additional role and probably not one that we're best equipped to develop. There was a report some years ago, wasn't there, of calling for artworks to be hung in pubs and bus stops mm -hmm. and making them more accessible in that way. Is that still necessary, or have the barriers been broken down sufficiently to...? I think there are a lot... I mean, there are some artists who would like to see their work shown in pubs, and they make that work for those conditions. I don't think you should necessarily take every Botticelli and put it, put it in <coughs> the next you know, a pub. Gentlemen, on the end of the row here. Yes. Julian Hohner, Thames and Hudson. Um, both of you have um, commissioned some world-class architecture. I wonder whether you'd like to comment on the role and significance of architecture in attracting visitors to museums in this century. I think um, great new buildings have often attracted visitors, but too many of them have not given a wonderful art experience for those visitors. And we've seen a whole swathe of buildings over the last 30, 40 years that have put architecture ahead of the experience of looking at works of art. And I therefore think that we're in for a period now where actually when you talk to many architects, they're much more reflective about the kinds of spaces that they want to make in which art can be seen and they're much more respectful, I'm generalizing wildly, but some at least are much more respectful of the place of the artist. I mean, that characteristic moment when an architect asks for the building to be opened provided there are no works of art in it, <laughs> which has happened on many occasions, <laughs> is one that one needs to move on from, I think. That makes it sound as though I don't believe there are good architects. There are, of course, there, is, there have been some wonderful buildings and some great opportunities for art to be seen in, in new ways. Which is the most successful of the new buildings of recent years? Oh, goodness me. Actually, I think probably some buildings that have been designed not by architects, but by artists acting as architects. So I think, for instance, of the museum just outside Dusseldorf, the museum Insel Hombroich, where an artist, Herich, made some great pavilions in which you go and see, have the kind of experience that Neil was describing earlier, perhaps not Ramesses II, but at least some great single works seen in isolation in good conditions of light and space and that captures kind of the art experience that many people seek. You, um, well, I know time is running out, we're going to have a question over there, but you both have plans on the table for extensions, don't you? Will those go ahead? Will you be building in the face of recession? Well, we hope so, yes. <laughs> and it's rather a good time to build. <laughs> Cheap labour. <laughs> you know, the, the, the best museums have been built during periods of recession. Exactly. Because that's the only moment at which museum trustees can afford to do it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a final question over here, and I think we're going to have to wrap up after that. 
Thank you. Angelina Rossa, I'm a researcher from Australia. Um, you've spoken about the museum mandate to share knowledge, and we've spoken a little bit about the internet, but we haven't really spoken of the internet as a communicative medium. As communication models themselves change from one-way to three-way th three communication, I wonder whether you could um, consider what the most significant transformations in cultural communication will be in the museum of the 21st century. I think for, for the reasons that you say, for all of us who work in museums to have a better understanding of what our audiences are looking for, I think it's been a very imperfect communication between visitors and curators in the past. And usually there's been another group who are sometimes called curators working in sections of the institution that have been termed learning, education, or whatever, who've interposed themselves between the curators and the public. And necessarily so in certain instances, and with great effect. But the possibility of a much more direct form of communication between our visitors and the people who work in museums must be the biggest opportunity that we have. I would, I th I mean, I would agree with that, of course. I think the, the other huge change that we've got to accomplish, which will transform uh, the use of our collections, is moving away from European languages. We have to start providing access to these great culture, these collections of world culture uh, in non-European languages. Um, that's an enormous venture, but at the moment, uh, the, you need to be able to use, really need to be able to use English. Um, and I think, in, and it's the other way around as well, that we, we need to reconfigure the information we provide about our collections so that they make sense to people who don't come from a base of European history. The, we have to, we have to de-Europeanize the information about our collection by making them, by rewriting the material and doing it in several languages. And that's a, that is a, a century long project, I think. So that's a vision of the future that um, I just want to just add to actually, because we have to wrap up and we are marking 60 years of Thames and Hudson here tonight. So Thames and Hudson launched at a time when the British cultural state was in its infancy and loads of money was pouring into the British cultural projects. Uh, the Arts Council had just been formed. Look ahead to another 60 years. What is your vision of the museum of whatever date it would be, 60 years hence? What role will it serve? Will it look like a very different place to the one that you preside over at the moment, Nick? It's bound to be... It, it may be rooted in those buildings we currently occupy, but it will necessarily address audiences across the world rather than in the locality. And it will be not simply a route of access to knowledge, but it will be a place where people across the world have conversations. And the institutions that take that fastest and furthest will be the ones to which authority arrives. And I think there will be a big shaking out, if you like, and a greater discrepancy between the institutions that really grasp those opportunities and those that don't. But it will be broadband alongside glass cases, still. Uh, yes, but it'll be more than that, because the, the other big revolution that we haven't really talked about is the revolution in transport of objects, which has completely changed the conversation about where things should be, what things can be together. And I would see in 60 years' time, I'm sure, and I would hope that the buildings that are there uh, now are still there and still visit in the same way, but certainly for the, for the British Museum's collection, I would imagine that a very large part of the collection would at any one time be on the road around the world, because that is now physically possible safely for the collection to move. And to allow, I mean, we're still again the fact that's extraordinary. We are a global world. We talk about global citizenship. Most people in China have never seen anything not made in China. They just can't. Uh, this, is, this is the challenge of the century. 
And how do we really make sure that the world can know about the world by studying the things, which is what museums and galleries are about. And that physical transport, I think, is just as important as the, as, as the internet in, in changing what the museum will be uh, over the next 30 years. My thanks to Sir Nicholas Sarota and to Neil McGregor. Thank you all very much indeed for coming, but uh, thank you very much. <laughs>